Welcome, everybody. Anna, Eulalia, Janie, Jill, Norma. We're happy that you can join us today. And again, we're going to be talking about the partnership development of aspect of communication planning. And this is our eighth session for the Community of Practice, the Strategic Planning Toolkit. So I am your presenter, one of your presenters and facilitators. I'm the Senior Advisor for the OUJC Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. And I would like to say, Daya Yahiti. Welcome. It is good you are here. That's in the Lakota language. I'd also um, like to introduce my friend and colleague and relative, uh, Colette Running Wolf. Would you like to greet the relatives out there, Colette? She might be on mute right now, so um, I'll just say um, that Paulette, Dr. Paulette Running Wolf is our technical assistant coordinator, one of them from the OJDDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. And her um, language is Blackfeet, and I believe they say it um, Oki. Hopefully, I said it right, Paulette. We um, have also planned to have Natalie Seitz. She's also a technical assistance coordinator with the OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. However, um, unfortunately, Natalie could not be here with us today, so we um, will be missing her, but wishing her and her family well. So um, I'd just like to, again, say welcome to this presentation. With um, any endeavor, any initiative, then we also want to acknowledge the Creator. We want to ask for blessings from the Creator for what we're going to talk about, what we're going to be um, discussing today. And the hope, the prayer is for a good outcome, the best outcome, so that our children and our families will benefit from what we're doing. That's the ultimate outcome, I believe, that we all want. We all want our children, our grandchildren, our families, and our communities to be healthy, to be happy. And so with that, I'm going to share an opening in my Lakota language. I was a little Thank you so much, everybody, for um, again for joining us. And what I said in my um, appeal to the Creator was what I had mentioned earlier was that we would like a blessing for what we're going to be talking about, what um, we are going to be discussing, so that the people, ultimately the children, will benefit from our work. Thank you. Here's our staff. We have the OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center staff, our director, Dr. Dolores Sylvia Bigfoot from the Caddo Nation, the assistant director and director of evaluation, Dr. J.B. Barchus, Cherokee Nation, our project manager, Courtney Ahurler from the Sack and Fox Nation, Creek, Pawnee, and Oto Nations. Our project manager, Janie Braden from Osage Caw Nation. Our project administration uh, person, our all around, our go to person, Gandra Laval from the Kiowa Nation. We have Dr. Paulette Running Wolf from the Blackfeet Nation. Anna Quell from the Mus Muscogee Creek and Yuki tribe. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, Toja and Natalie Stite from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Myself, I am Ogallala Lakota, Ethelene Iron Cloud Two Dogs. I also have Crow ancestry. Jerry Weisner from the Muscogee Creek Nation, and Toja Aaron Pinout from the Sichuan Lakota Nation. Here's our agenda. 
We'd like to uh, discuss the importance of creating and maintaining partnerships toward achieving program goals and objectives. We would also like to review a partnership model that is culturally based and learn how communication plans are integral to collaborative agreements and partnership development. And of course, our wrap up and our closing. So again, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're all together in this work, and like I said, we all have a common goal, which is to make life better for our children, our youth, our families, our grandchildren, our communities. So I really appreciate all the work that you all are doing out there. So we're going to, we'd like to hear from you. What characterizes great partnerships? And when we're talking about partnerships, we're talking about well, say you want to get something done in your community, and you know that you can't do it by yourself, so then you reach out to people. And you have experience with partnerships, with forming partnerships, with uh, maintaining partnerships, with ending partnerships. So we'd like to hear from you. What characterizes great partnerships in your opinion? So go ahead and type in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. I know people are typing. There's a lot of uh, different types of partnerships out there, and we'll talk about that also. But any type of partnership that you've been engaged and involved in what do you recall about it? And Anna is saying the ability to collaborate and provide positive input and feedback in a helpful way. That is so important, the positive input and feedback. How many of you have been in partnerships where, or collaborative um, organizations, collaborative groups where when somebody suggest something, then somebody will say, oh, we already tried that. That doesn't work. So that positive input is really, really critical to moving the partnership forward. Tina is saying communication, openness to other ideas. I totally agree that communication is something that we really need to keep open. Area, collaboration with all entities from the community not only with the service providers, but the community members, elders, youth leaders, to obtain a goal. I agree, Yuvelia. I think the collaboration is um, key to achieving anything, but we also have to look at, and we also have to look at who's in that collaborative um, aspect of it. Are we inviting community members? Are we inviting elders, youth, or is it the people that, um, what, what's that saying? The same 10 people, the, the um, people that are involved in organizations and um, you know, we tend to rely on people that are, have always been involved. So getting community members, elders, youth um, involved is really important. Paulette, uh, relationship building, positive experiences result in partners becoming like family. Yes. How do we build that relationship? And more about committed partners result in great partnerships. Very important, that commitment. I think the definition of uh, commitment and collaboration needs to be defined by partners just because um, we might say, well, I'll come when I can, but uh, I'm not really committed but I'd like to collaborate you know, in some way. So there's different levels, I think, of that commitment and collaboration. Chelsea, finding a common ground to work together and create meaningful outcomes. Thank you for that. That common ground where we might disagree on things, but what is our common ground? What is our common goal? Jill, connection is the key to recovery. We seek every opportunity to bring in as many and help as many healthy and appropriate partnerships as possible. Very important. 
that connection and also um, focusing on healthy and appropriate partnerships because there's unhealthy, right? And those can be created also. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for chiming in there. Um, your, your input is very important. So I'm going to turn it over to Paulette now. She's going to be talking about defining a partnership. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me OK. I was struggling with the mute button earlier. It just wasn't muting or unmuting, so I apologize for missing the opening. Um, I'm really excited about this webinar. I think partnership is such a uh, key concept in terms of implementing new programs in Indian country. It's just an essential element. Um, and in terms of defining a partnership, two or more individuals or entities working together toward a common goal. And often it's multiple people um, reaching towards that common goal. And these can often be formalized with a um, memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of, a, of agreement, and which outlines a clear expectation of roles and responsibilities of each partner, data collection um, sharing agreements, all of those kinds of elements can be formalized in an MOU or MOA. Um, partnerships can be informal as well with no written agreement, just with a clear um, commitment um, to work together. So there'll be, there, there'll be some partners that you will not need to have a written agreement. Uh, sharing resources, that's an excellent way to share resources. They're commonly collaboratively fund different aspects of uh, your service delivery structure. Often that can sustain a program much beyond a grant funding period. Uh, it, they are, partnerships are collaborative. And that's really a key word for partnership. Um, I think collaboration is um, you know, kind of the new buzzword in today's grants world. But um, it's such a key concept in terms of working together. And lastly, partnership um, has effective communication, and, and that's crucial. So everybody understands each other. We all have such varied ways of communicating. Um, so making sure that you're having effective communication and frequent communication to update everybody um, is really helpful. So this is a picture. I just love this picture. It was a lodge in the background all the kids and, and a few adults there. Um, and there's a quote here from Jefferson Keel, who's the executive board president of NCAI. He said, our future success as tribal nations is directly linked to how effectively we communicate and advocate for the issues important to all our people. So true. Tribal nations and tribal organizations will always be stronger when we can speak with one voice, one that is strong, unified, and clear. And I just want to pay um, homage to the Standing Rock tribe and all of the efforts that those young people have initiated. I just, um, it's just such a blessing to see that happening and have all of our nations come together to support this effort to keep our clean water. Communication is a factor. So partnerships are more effective when communication is effective. And the example that we provide is that when, one, when two or more partners work on a project together, if communication is not clear as to who will do what, by when, then misunderstanding, misunderstandings can occur when that which further weaken the relationship and the partnership. So that's been a real um, key element of partnership is making sure that you communicate not only frequently but effectively. If there's um, a partner that doesn't often do email, which is pretty true in Indian country um, in our real isolated communities, then you need to figure out a better way to communicate with your partners to make sure that um, they understand what's going on, what's going to happen, what you need them to do, what you're going to do, and so forth. So. I think that's really important is making sure that you have an effective communication plan. 
and a definition of communication, a construct that embodies cultural life ways, methods, and strategies for message giving and message receiving that include both verbal and nonverbal. I think that's really important, um, the fact that we often rely on nonverbal communication via email, via Facebook, via all of those different methods that we rely with technology today, that you can't really um, read between the lines and often there'll be problems if they cannot see your, your nonverbal expressions or the way that you phrase something um, sounds twisted in their mind or offensive. Um, so those nonverbal um, indications that ha occur in written communications are, are really difficult. So making sure that as often as possible that you do it verbally, maybe picking up the phone rather than relying on um, an email message or a text those kinds of things. So communication um, is so um, essential in terms of um, embodying our, our cultural life ways. And I strongly recommend that you consider how your project communication, communicates with not only your partners, but across the community. How do you communicate about your program to parents? That might look a whole lot different than how you communicate with partners. So keeping that in mind, but there's different ways of communicating with different stakeholder groups. Thank you, Paulette. And speaking of nonverbal messaging, so what uh, I'd like to hear from you. Write a caption for this photo. We like to um, emphasize, you know, the, the nonverbal messages that photos give or even body language or know uh, what uh, Paulette was talking about earlier, how important that is to include that in the communication aspect of partnerships. So let's hear from you. What do you, looking at this photo, write a caption for it. Mm -hmm. What could we say about this photo? What are some of your thoughts? I know some of you are typing. So what does it inspire in you or what does it, um, what's, what are some of the first words that come to mind? I am a proud Native man, an honored tribal leader. Yes, I agree with those comments. And I think this, the messaging that we uh, put out there to the community can also be termed social marketing. So are we, what are we marketing? What message are we marketing out there? What do we want the community to uh, remember? So if you remember something about this webinar, then remember this photo here, that you can associate the webinar with the photo that kind of thinking, you know, when we put our message out there to the community, then uh, we want them to remember what we're trying to tell them. I stand strong, but I walk with caution. Honoring tradition. Proud to display cultural regalia and traditional symbols. Proud and focused. So strength, honor, uh, pride. Uh, tradition, focus, all of those words come to mind. So just think about that whenever you're doing your social marketing, your messaging for your project. If you want the community to remember something, the, the message that you're trying to put out there, perhaps associating your message with a photo might be helpful. So maybe a poster. Uh, putting this poster, for example, out in the community and asking community members, you to write a caption for it. That might be uh, an activity that you could do that, um, or any other type of photo. So just think about that. Thank you so much for um, 
your input on this. I, I think those uh, comments are very appropriate. So what is the purpose of communication? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to inform? If you are, then maybe a platform or a media might be a flyer. Maybe there's an upcoming event that you're having. So you'll do a flyer, you'll do a public announcement, perhaps TV, radio. You want to inform people about something. Or are you trying to persuade them? Behavior change. So we might do training in person, online. We might do audio recordings. We might do um, like the OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center has um, avatar trainings that uh, we're developing. So we hope that those will be helpful in terms of impacting behavior. So we're trying to persuade. Or are we trying to engage? So for example, we want a call to action. Perhaps there is um, something that we want to impact. Uh, let's use child abuse as an example in the community. We want people to, we want to engage the community in doing a, um, like say, a child abuse prevention activity. So we might have a public forum. And we might say, we might have something like a GONA, maybe a gathering of Native Americans, where we say, well, here's an issue in our community. How are we going to deal with this? So we're engaging the community. We might also do um, something on social media, where we can reach a lot of people, and we're trying to engage them to action. Or is the purpose of uh, the communication to instruct? teach how to do something, perhaps in person, a video um, instructional type of uh, method that we put together to show people how to do something. So what is the purpose? I think that needs to be defined as far as, um, as, far as engaging in a social marketing communication type of campaign. What are we trying to do? So messaging is critical. So let's talk about how to get an effective message out. First, we need to plan for communication. Who is your audience? Who are your stakeholders? What is the design for internal communication? For example, you know, we have a we might have a process how we communicate as staff people. We might want to design something for external communication. Say there is, for example, a school. A school has uh, maybe some kind of event or maybe some kind of crisis that happens. They'll have a protocol for the, who, who speaks to the media, you know, that type of design. And a plan for management communication. I think that's very critical because there's, um, there's a need to know who needs to know what. Um, and management will have a different type of communication model than with the entire staff, for example, or community. And lastly, horizontal communications with peers. How do we communicate with one another as far as colleagues, as far as students, whatever the community is? What is appropriate? What is inappropriate within families even? So the messaging is very critical. The planning for messaging is very important to the impact of the message. So what is a communication plan? It's a framework that is formulated to provide a process for either public or non-public messaging and interpreting messages. So I'd like to just highlight interpreting messages. So for example, you hear a public message. Your interpretation might be completely different than 
the next person's interpretation. So we have to realize that too. Who is our audience? Who are we trying to um, impact with our message? How will it be interpreted? A communication plan is a tool to help with accomplishing your project. So um, we, we also have to um, realize that one communication product or one campaign may not be enough. So we may have a communication product that is, um, you know, we have a PSA on the radio to um, impact a certain segment of the population. But we may need a bigger campaign to prevent um, drug abuse, for example. So we have to think about you know, that framework and how we're going to use that tool. There's different types of communication plans also. As you know, there's professional in the workplace with our partners, our clients, our customers our colleagues, there's also family. What is the emergency communication plan within a family? What are acceptable and unacceptable modes of communication? We also have crisis communication plans. For example, a school communication plan would include who talks to the media when there's a crisis, as mentioned before. So there's different types. As you, as you well know. So he, who needs to know what, when? So if you look at the top of this table here, there's the audience, there's a mission and vision, the goals and objectives, the individual actions, the key performance indicators, and the accomplishments. So those are the areas of, for example, are your organization our projects that we are working with. So the board would need to know mission and vision. In fact, the board probably formulated the mission and vision. The board would need to know about the goals and objectives. The board wouldn't need necessarily need to know about individual actions of staff, for example. They would need to know, they would want to know about the key performance indicators. Are we achieving what we set out to do? And the accomplishments. The board would want to know, well, what have we accomplished? What have we done so far? The director would need to know all of those. The managers would need to know, would want to know different aspects of, this, of the mission vision goals and objectives, individual actions, performance indicators, and accomplishments. The staff and the community members may not need to know or want to know all of those different areas, but they would want to be engaged in certain areas as appropriate. So I think this table would be helpful in terms of um, deciding who needs to know what, when. So how often do we, do we uh, let the board know, or how often does the board let the community know of what has been accomplished by the organization? See, that's another issue is um, timeliness as far as who is going to know what, when. Is it at an annual, part of an annual report? By annual, you know, you, you'll need to decide that. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Paulette to talk about the communication plan template. Paulette? I, sure. I just wanted to comment on that last slide that you did, Ethelene. I think that's just really a good way to frame general communication with your program in terms of anticipating and uh, planning for regular communication with each of those audiences. I think that's really a good way to think about it because there's always, I think, some things that you want to share but may not be appropriate. And making those decisions ahead of time, this, this template really helps you do that. So I just wanted yeah. to 
to comment on how uh, useful I think that template is. And on the next slide, this is a sample communication template. Um, and notice across the top, it lists each of the stakeholders. I mean, uh, the first column lists the stakeholders, parents and partners, for instance. Those, those would be different. Um, and the first or the second column, key information to provide or gain key messages. So an example of a key message that you want to portray to your, your parents and your, the parents and family members or the kids that you're serving is a family strengthening message. Um, in contrast to, and how would you go about doing that? Um, would you do it at one-on-one? -on -one? You could do it at parent-family meetings. Um, maybe at the uh, MDT meeting, you want to share something particularly um, useful that, that it's important that parents understand or realize in terms of implementing their treatment plan. Um, and how frequently do you want to communicate with your parents? I think we often rely on kids to share that information with parents, and that is not always an effective <laughs> Uh, techniques. I think the more that programs can communicate with parents, that you're going to establish a better relationship with them because they know what the expectations are. They know what's happening. And when to send or hold communication. So that thinking about when you're going to send out those um, um, e email, uh, maybe you do it by email, maybe you do it by blog, or maybe other social media. Uh, when, when, when would be a good day to do that? Sunday might be a better day because a lot of parents work or are otherwise engaged. Um, and who is responsible for organizing and developing the content of the communication and, and making sure that's understood? Often we might rely on a partner to do that, and maybe the partner didn't understand that because you didn't have clear communication. But here you're laying out exactly who's responsible for that, and who's responsible for the distribution or the delivery of that message. And for instance, in this case, it's the parent coordinator. So all of those aspects are really important. In contrast with partners, you might want to send them um, significant information, maybe data about uh, the, the, the child CPS reports for the past quarter. That might be an important piece of information that they um, need to have. For instance, maybe the rates went up or the rates went down. Either way, it's important that they understand how productive or what's happening um, as a result of the communications that you're doing in your community. And you might share that information um, during collaborative meetings, maybe with your community advisory board or committee. Uh, maybe you'll do it at a uh, collaborative collaborative meeting that involves several different tribal departments in your community. So sharing that kind of deciding when and where and how to share that kind of information. In this case, maybe you don't think partners need um, regular communications except for on a monthly basis. And you develop a clear method of, of sending that information. And you do it on the last Friday of each month. And each program director rotates um, developing that material. So you take turns doing that. And again, that's all about relationship building. And finally, who is responsible for that distribution of that message? In this case, the chairperson that's um, chairing the meeting via the agenda. So all of those pieces, I think, are really important to think about in advance. If you're really looking at a trauma-informed system of care, you want to make sure that communication is regular. Our communities regularly undergo considerable trauma. There's death every day. Um, yesterday, an elder of ours was out farming his land, and he either had a heart attack or fell off of his swather, and his wife noticed his swather going around and around in circles, and she went over to check on him, and he had passed. So such horrible events occur regularly in our communities with suicides, that type of thing. So thinking about how you're going to communicate with partners and parents on those kinds of 
traumatic um, experiences, as well as sharing successes um, and accomplishments is really crucial in terms of maintaining viable partnerships and consistent communication. Thank you, Paula. I just wanted to comment, um, first of all, I, my condolences to your uh, people on the loss of your elder. Anytime we lose an elder, it's very, very difficult, very impactful to everybody because they take body of knowledge, a body of um, experience, you know, that cannot be replaced. So my condolences to your community. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the, um, the participants, how many of you um, have some form of a communication plan for your organization, for your project? And while you're um, typing that in, in the chat box, I'd just like to comment about um, what you were talking about earlier, Paulette, about how there's so many critical issues that we really need to um, have something structured to communicate that about, you know, the accomplishments or the progress, the status of a project to our leadership so that they can use that information. Um, so my question is, you know, how many of you have a communication plan for your project? And it may not look like this, but it may be some type of protocol maybe a procedure or, you know, something that would speak to a communication plan. So um, in terms of, for example, Paulette, uh, what you mentioned earlier about, you know, suicide in Indian country. So are we communicating that to our leadership in terms of the number of suicide attempts, the number of suicide uh, completions, in Indian country are our national organizations that advocate for us, for example, the National Indian Health Board or the National Congress of American Indians. Do we have a process of communicating that to those organizations that are in a position to advocate for uh, Indian um, youth, uh, Native American issues? You know, what is our what is our process? So Jill is saying that we're developing more MOUs currently to manage collaborative efforts and communication. So that's very encouraging. So the MOU would outline, you know, I'm sure, you know, the process of communication, the um, process of collaboration. So those are, um, I think, important points to consider in terms of um, the structure of it, what it would look like. So maybe it's an MOU. You know, maybe the MOU is like, well, we'll meet once a month and we'll bring an update on what we're doing or you know, whatever it is, whatever it will um, outline. And Norma's saying, in our juvenile drug court, the JDC team meets weekly and the advisory board meets every quarter. So there's a very regular process of um, communication that the juvenile drug, drug court has as far as uh, meeting on the juvenile detention, uh, juvenile drug court team uh, meeting weekly and the advisory board meeting every quarter. So <clears throat> thank you for that input. And I just wanted to make that comment, Paulette, before you went on to the next slide. Sure, thank you. So in terms of effective communication plans, typically they are written. I don't know too many people that can maintain um, that amount of information um, and immediate recall in their memory. So take the time. I know it, it can be tedious but take the time and utilize these templates as a way to establish a written plan to respond to and address all communications that are coming out of your program. Um, make sure that your messaging is consistent. Don't, don't, on one occasion, send out a message and then have to come back and say, I'm sorry, that was incorrect. Please see this message. This is correct information. So making sure that 
whatever you're saying is consistent and assuring that, that it is consistent by providing that message. Address crisis and regular day-to-day -day communication. Make sure that, um, that you do have a plan to address those crisis situations as we discussed earlier. Um, I really like the idea of including um, that uh, communication planning with your partners. Um, I think it's really helpful um, to make, make sure that you share that process and share that load because it can become overwhelming. Our communities are overwhelmed in trauma. So by taking turns, it doesn't seem as overwhelming to individual administrators or staff that are tasked with uh, providing for effective communication. Um, the other point that this slide makes is that make sure that you have both external and internal communication processes. So you kind of have a branding, if you will, of the communication that goes out to the community. You have a certain expectation of quality, appearance, and so forth. Um, and then in terms of your internal communication, practice making sure that your communication is respectful and not derogatory in any way or not blaming. Because having internal connect communication among staff that, that becomes tit for tat um, can create problems. So make, making sure that just as a matter of course that you have respectful internal communication processes as well and you establish that for your staff. The other point is that it's important to be transparent. We talk about that all the time. And I think we make a real good effort at being transparent in terms of our expectations, in terms of what we want to accomplish or what we're really truly planning about, that we, we want to all come together and make sure that we're in support of whatever it is that you're focusing on, whether it's de decreasing the number of youth entering the juvenile justice court or increasing the cultural identity of our youth. Whatever it is, be as transparent as possible. Think about those messages and which messages really get to the crux of you being transparent. Often we might have a lot of different um, ideas or thoughts or activities or responsibilities. And in that, transparency sometimes gets lost. So make sure that you are consistent in terms of being transparent in your communication. And the next bullet uh, are a part of formal and informal partnerships. So don't discount informal partnerships as not being as important as formal partnerships. For instance, your tribal treatment program may be a key partner and you have a formal MOU in contrast to um, an informal partnership with the local domestic violence program. Well, communicating with both of them is really as important as the other. Um, making sure that everybody is on board and has is receiving that same communication. Um, because there are going to be times when you're going to need to draw on those informal partnerships that are not defined by MOUs or MOAs. Um, include regular and ongoing training. Training, Really, um, I think it's really difficult to set up a schedule of regular training. But one of the things that we're finding in Indian Country, um, and I just want to speak to this briefly, uh, the Grand Round Tribe is part of a pilot project that is, is testing uh, trauma-informed system of care training. And they're working with all of the different departments in, in, within social services and educational services to become a trauma, truly a trauma-informed system. So um, there are, as a part of that process, staff and, and various departments all have input on what their, their needs are in terms of training. So making sure that you use this as an opportunity for whatever data that you're gathering. If you see a training need, be sure to identify it and incorporate it in to your planning efforts. Um, because often things perk up that we hadn't anticipated. So keep that in mind. And then lastly, monitor media coverage for errors in reporting. 
I see this happening consistently, um, and it's just a typo or something was left off in a newspaper article, and, and nobody goes back and corrects it. Well, in terms of our history, I think it's really important. We, we've historically relied on storytelling and, and sharing that historical memory that we, we each bring forward from our ancestors. So um, making sure that this communication process that we have in today's 21st century, it's so technologically based, doesn't report errors and without correcting them. So keep an eye on that. Make sure somebody's tasked, tasked with monitoring those errors and correcting them. Um, I, I just can't suggest that enough. One example I give um, sometimes is there was a journal article that was written in the early 1900s about black sheep women and how they were really strong, opinionated women and how they um, seemed to overpower the men um, in different decision-making processes. And then the, the, the author goes on to speculate that these women were lesbian women, and this is why they were so verbal, that non-lesbian women would not be so verbal. So those are the kinds of errors that I think that go down in history and people wonder about and speculate. So make sure that any reporting, that you monitor the errors and you correct them as soon as feasibly possible because those things happen. So that's, that's what a, I would suggest. That's a great example, Paula. Um, there's a lot of media reports out there like um, we all live in teepees. <laughs> we all get exactly. a government check. <laughs> um, right. and, and, you know, that's um, something that we have to continuously keep an eye on. As you said, would you say, Paulette, that an effective communication plan would also include who is responsible for communication, uh, public for, you know, keeping everything going as far as um, you know, meeting notices, um, public statements to the media, public statements, to public reports to the community, to the Travel Council, would you say that should be included in this also? I would definitely say that. I think some of us are better communicators than others. Some of us are more comfortable in front of the media, whether it's TV cameras or radio or what have you, video. Um, and others of us prefer to be in the background. So find somebody that's very dynamic and charismatic and attach them to be the face of your program. Um, and then they will be responsible to make sure that reporting is correct, accurate, and done appropriately. So I think that's a very important point to make sure that you have somebody that's, you know, assigned or tasked with that role in your project. So, for example, Hamas Pueblo has developed a Hamas Justice Advisory Committee that meets on a monthly basis for collaboration and coordination. And uh, Diane says, we have advisory board meetings scheduled on a quarterly basis for community input. So those two entities, I'm sure, have a process for communication. Who's responsible for what and how, um, who speaks on behalf of those uh, boards or those committees. So that's something that I think is real important in terms of um, knowing who is responsible for speaking publicly or getting the word out. I agree fully. Okay, on this next slide, we're talking about features of culturally based partnerships and communication models. I want you to think about that for a minute. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit about it earlier on, about relation building as being a critical element of that. Sometimes we're rushed. We want to get this meeting started. We want to get this meeting over. 
And so we're very abrupt, and we're not very respectful, and we don't appreciate, um, you know, the 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 time that that it takes to maintain that relationship and continue to build it. But it really is an essential component of communication. Um, so taking the time, slowing down, making sure everybody's had their say, that we're, we're people that tend to um, make decisions by consensus. And if somebody hasn't had their opportunity to share their voice, verbalize their concerns or their support, then often that may become difficult. So taking the time to make sure that relationship recognizes that everybody has a role in that. And the next bullet talks about reciprocity, giving and receiving. And uh, Ethelene and I have had several conversations about this, how in some communities it's become difficult because everybody wants to get paid and um, how, you know, there's a certain expectation there around reciprocity. If you have an elder come to do the opening prayers or to provide a, a support message to your youth um, in a youth support group, whatever. So there's this ex expectation that we all have, whether it's verbally um, stated or not, that we're giving and receiving information. And that, that information, whatever it is, is as, 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 is as valuable as a, you know, a bulging bank account. Because without reciprocity, we would not have survived as a Native people. So I really want to have you think about how reciprocity is acted on in your community. What's appropriate? What are we doing about that? How are we how are we framing it? How are we supporting um, uh, uh, greed or generosity or all of those different aspects that could be interpreted uh, when you're expected to give and receive gifts and information, um, your thoughts, all of that is gifting. Um, so keeping that in mind as respectful people. You want to make sure that reciprocity is respected, and it's respected in a way that is culturally appropriate in your community. So thinking about that process, I think, is essential. Another bullet is communication strategies appropriate to your local culture. Now, what might be OK in your community might not be in my community, or vice versa. And, and thinking about that and how that communication strategy would play out in your community is really helpful in advance before you actually do it. I think it's really important that you take the time and think about what are our cultural norms around communication? What are our expectations? How do we verbalize those expectations? How do we act on those expectations? What kind of behavior is associated with those? So thinking that through, having that discussion either with your advisory committees or within your staff meetings, all of that is really, really helpful in advance so that you can save yourself some grief um, because you didn't think, you think it through. You saw a strategy that was on social media and you thought, oh, this is a great way to go. Let's just do it. Well, come to think of it, now I wish I would have really thought that through and done it slightly differently or done something else. So um, taking that time and thinking about what are the strategies that are appropriate in your tribal community. The other thing that's important to recognize is that we are a storytelling people. That's where we have our history. We tend to do that. It's OK. And white culture tells us it's not OK. We don't need to hear all of your extra stories. That's just um, extra. We don't, you know, I'm not really interested in that. And in our way, in our values, in our beliefs, storytelling is crucial. My mother often goes to the doctor. And when I've gone with her, the doctor will, she'll try to tell the doctor what's wrong with her. You know, what's, what's going on? She has this big, long story about this happened, this happened, this happened. 
And then this happened. Well, before she could get to the final point of her story, the doctor's interrupting and trying to change the subject and saying she's going to pro provide certain medication. So um, that's an example of how we speak, how we communicate, and storytelling is okay. We need to make sure that we continue that tradition and we strengthen that tradition. So thinking about how you can incorporate in your program, incorporate storytelling in your program. I think is really helpful, uh, whether it's with your partners, uh, whether it's talking about communication processes, whatever it is, letting people tell their stories. The next bullet, one-to-one -one delivery with culturally specific videos, flyers, and brochures. So that's another method, um, is to actually um, go out into the community and have flyers or distribute brochures at the WIC office, at the Indian Health Service Clinic. Or maybe have a video of your program that, defi that identifies the services that are available. And maybe some of your families would be willing to participate in, in that video and share their stories and their successes. What a great way to facilitate that. I know many communities have traditional spiritual practices that involve storytelling and involve um, those culturally specific um, issues. So taking the time to think about how you can do that is really helpful and really engaging for our family. They feel comfortable with that. And then there's Native-specific public service announcements and videos. There's a lot of different ideas out there that we can tailor to meet the needs of our community. So be as creative as possible in thinking about the different ways that you can share communication or share information um, about your program or about how success, successful your program. Or maybe there's some unmet needs you have and you're appealing to the community to help for your, to get support. Uh, maybe you're trying to raise money so your kids could go join the Standing Rock kids. What a great way to do that, by having those kinds of public service announcements. And I think by approaching it from a tribal-specific approach, you're going to have a much more um, um, impact in the community. And lastly, one of the standing uh, values is we like to share food. Make sure that there is food available. And, and I realize that with federal government today and all of the, the prohibitions from spending your budget items on food, there's other ways to share food. If you put the call out to the community that you need um, some salads or some meat or some uh, silverware and paper goods uh, for a, a celebration with your project. You'd be surprised how many of the parents, families, and community members would respond and be glad to share their food. So um, making sure, and they feel good about it, gives them the opportunity to contribute. Maybe it's not much. Maybe it's only a box of hardtack. But whatever it is, it's appreciated, and 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 you, you let them know that it's appreciated, and compliment them on that. That's oh, really wow. important. Really important, Paula, as far as like sharing. It's about um, physical nourishment. It's about expressing generosity, which I know is a a value among most, if not all, of our indigenous people you know, that we, if we're going to eat, then we'll share you know, our food. Um, it's also you know, a form of uh, comforting, a form of connection, making, sharing food, sharing a meal with somebody, and having um, you know, a conversation while you're doing it is, you know, can build that relationship. So thank you for those. You're welcome. I, um, in the chat box, I put, if you have questions or comments, feel free to type them, type them in. Um, I know that <clears throat> having a 90-minute webinar, you know, uh, for a lot of people, it's um, difficult to stay focused sometimes, so we really 
encourage you know, you giving input, questions, comments. We appreciate, we'd appreciate that. So what are some other features of culturally based partnerships and communication models? Uh, personal contact and use of um, targeted media. So for example, you know, if you want um, elders there, and Paulette mentioned this before, if you want elders there, then how do you approach them? Do you put a, um, a PSA out and say, we would like all elders to come to this meeting, we would need your input, which might be appropriate for some communities, but like um, Paulette stated, it may not be appropriate for another community. What well, might be appropriate is going directly to them and saying, we'd really like your input on this issue. Um, you know, here's um, maybe some gas money to get to the meeting if, if you know, far, far out, or maybe we could provide transportation. You know, um, so really making personal contact. Another aspect is ongoing outreach and maintaining contact. So, for example, we might ask for a letter of support or a grant application from elders or from a community group. And then we don't have any contact with them until it's time to renew the grant. And, and we go back to them and say, well, you know, we uh, appreciate that you provided support last time. So this time we're going to um, renew our grant and we'd like your support again. But in the meantime, we didn't have any kind of contact with them. We didn't inform them about progress on the grant or anything like that. So that would be, I guess, a a way to contrast what would be effective communication and ineffective communication. A silence is not a deficit. So for example, go to meetings and the Western model of communication is to fill time and space with verbiage, meaning that you know you just talk and talk and talk just to be talking. Among many indigenous communities, Silence is not a deficit. For example, among the Lakota people, Anahokta is a Lakota word that's translated as to listen. Um, but the Lakota language is, um, like many of your languages, is concept-based. So it actually means when you break it down, ah, come to attention. So whenever we were children, if my mother my father said, ah, then we would stop what we were doing and come to attention. Why are they calling us, you know, uh, calling our attention? They, they want us to hear something or see something. The whole means to record it, meaning, um, you know, record it in your mind, what you're hearing. Ah, means to turn it over, examine it, deliberate on it. So, before you respond, some cultures will express silence, not as a negative response, but as time for consideration and reflection. So we really have to think about that, you know, how the cultural aspects of communication can impact our partnership with different segments of the community. So let's chat. What is an example of an inappropriate communication tactic or strategy with respect to your culture? Give us uh, some uh, examples of that. So if we were to come to your community, your culture, and do this, it would be uh, inappropriate. So fill in the blank. What is an example of an inappropriate communication tactic or strategy with respect to your culture. I see some people typing. We'd like to hear from you about inappropriate communication tactics or strategies. Shut up. Very inappropriate, right, Paulette? If somebody says shut up to somebody, then it's very disrespectful. 
it's kind of the language of kids today and being aware and, and warning them and letting them know that is inappropriate, not continuing to accept it. So with that in mind, say if you're working with a youth group, then you might want to facilitate a discussion about what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. That would be an activity where they could see that shut up might be considered very disrespectful. Speaking over one another. Thank you, Jill. I think that is one of the um, areas that we really need to um, take a look at because a lot of times we want to get our opinion out there, we want to get our thought out there, and we'll rush into the conversation without realizing that somebody is talking, hasn't finished talking, or we might just think, what I have to say is more important than what you have to say. So I'm going to talk over you. So there's some different perspectives there that we have to think about. Diane um, commented about rolling your eyes, facial expressions when you're supposed to be listening. I think that's very important, that nonverbal communication. When you're rolling your eyes, it might mean what you're saying is not really what you're saying. Or people might frown, people might laugh. Um, and how is that interpreted? What is the message there? April commented about not being a good listener. And maybe we need training on being a good listener. Kathleen, interrupting during conversation or not paying attention, being a poor listener. I think um, you know, we, whenever we talk about listening, have you ever gone to meetings and people are on their phone? They're texting or they're checking their email or they're maybe on Facebook. <laughs> Um, so what does that, what, what kind of message does that give? That they're not engaged with the meeting or whatever is going on there, that they're more engaged with what's going on on their phone, right? <clears throat> so we have to think about what we're communicating also by our actions. So Paula talks about identifying key words in your traditional language that facilitate communication like the example given, listen, uh, provides a way to introduce, educate, and promote our traditional languages. I really like that. I think that would be, um, so, so for example, those of you that, um, that would like to give input, what is the word for listen in your language? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student of languages, including my own, so I'm always interested in what other languages, um, the, the terms for like listen, the terms for compassion, the terms for um, all of those nurturing types of words. So in your language, what what is the word for listen? April talks about in our community it's important to not rush. It's important to allocate enough time. That is so true, April. I think when there's going to be a sensitive uh, discussion, a discussion about a sensitive topic, we have to give people enough time to express what they're thinking. So for example, um, I've gone to forums where they talked about decolonization. Decolonization might bring up some painful memories about historical trauma, for example. So people will uh, talk about that, perhaps get angry about it, cry about it, and there's not enough time for, to process those feelings. So we have to really think about the topics, enough time. I agree, April. Allocate enough time. 
you for that. Thank you for the uh, input on that. So we're going to talk about some very culturally based nonverbal communication and messages. So far, we've been talking about communication among humans. As indigenous people, we know that we have a relationship with the entities, the spirits in the universe. So I'll give you an example. Um, among our people, the Lakota people, the birds give us messages. So when the birds gathered toward the end of summer, the people know fall is approaching and certain tasks have to be completed before fall comes. The horses, when the horses run around or run around in a spirited manner, the people know a storm is approaching, so then they take certain precautions. The buffalo, when a buffalo is butchered in the summertime, the thickness of the spleen indicates how severe the coming winter will be. So whenever the uh, buffalo is butchered, then they'll take out the spleen and they'll examine it and say if it's really, really um, thick, then that means a lot of snow is coming. So <clears throat> that's how people would tell, you know, about the coming season. The drum. Many indigenous people believe the drum has a spirit and is a medicine, so the drum would be given water, tobacco as an offering. So we have these relationships with non-human entities in the universe that we need to honor, and that's something that um, might have to be built within your communication plan, you know, not just among humans. So. We wanted to uh, bring that aspect to honor our uh, indigenous life ways in terms of communication. So what questions do you have as far as communication goes, as far as the information that you've heard? If you have any questions, then type them in the chat box, and Paulette and I will do our best to respond to them. Otherwise, um, we would like to review we know, we've covered, discussed, that partnerships can be key to accomplishing a project, particularly those projects that are very complex in nature, say in your court system. Maybe you want to reduce um, juvenile uh, recidivism. Maybe you want to um, increase um, family strengthening projects within your community. We need partners to do that. Effective communication is a critical element to forming and maintaining effective partnerships. If we want to have a strong and effective partnership, then we need to nurture it. We need to maintain it. And we need to have effective communication, respectful, honoring one another's input, even if we disagree. Communication purposes include instructing, engaging, persuading, informing. What, what do we want to accomplish by our communication? Communication plans are integral to organizations, projects, schools, and families. So whenever I was doing the, the research for this uh, webinar, then I thought about the communication plan for my own family, my own um, extended family and my own immediate family. And we had a, a meeting of some of my relatives. And we talked about bringing in one, two of our elders to talk about the bloodline and to talk about protocols that uh, we'd like to promote within our extended family. So we're going to be doing that sometime in September. So this was an uh, incentive. It, it inspired me to, to um, partner with my relatives on, on bringing information to our, our community, I mean, our extended family and our, and our younger people. Cultural communication and partnership models should be included in the communication plan. 
what is appropriate culturally? What are what's what what does partnership mean to us? What does collaboration mean to us? So Paula, I don't know if you want to add anything to the wrap up, to the review, any final points you want to emphasize or make? I'd just like to add um, one of the things that I noticed that you do frequently, Ethelene, that I really appreciate um, and honor is the fact that you label the relationship of the person that you're communicating with. For instance, um, you call Natalie your Trojan. Now she's your niece, or your, I'm not sure what the translation is. Yes, that's um, niece. Niece, OK. And how appropriate that is, and how inclusive that is, and how much that builds relationships. So if you can figure out, and each I would challenge each of you program people to think about the titles that you call people and use your traditional language to call attention to those key relationships, whether they're blood relationships or not, if it's auntie or uncle or grandma or, or whatever, um, to make sure to see if you can come up with those terms or those salutations that um, that I guess provide a, a high level of cultural respect for the person that you're talking to, how um, soothing and comfortable and nurturing that is. And if we can teach our kids those, even if they don't know all of the language, but they understand that if they call you Trojan, your niece or your grandma or your mom, you know, whatever it is, however you um, title each other in terms of your relationships by using it in your, your traditional language and teaching our kids that, then it calls attention to those relationships and how important it is um, that you communicate with that. Um, and it, it just really hammers the point home in terms of culturally appropriate communication. Thank you for that, Paulette. I think um, another point to consider is that using kinship terms establishes boundaries and promotes respect, promotes belonging. You know, we belong to one another, and we need to honor one another, like you said. So I really appreciate you stressing that point. That's exactly it, the kinship, yes. Thank you for that. I, if that there's no, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say I challenge all of the participants in the webinar today to find that out. Take the time to find that out and then begin utilizing that as a normal communication pattern in your programs. Great challenge. We have, um, among our people, we have a sheet with all of the kinship terms according to the male gender, the female gender, and we have a um, pronunciation key, like we'll spell it phonetically so people will know how to say it, and Great. relationship. Yeah, so it's very useful for the um, younger people and people that um, haven't been exposed to, you know, using the kinship terms. Um, I think it's, you know, if we were to take that into meetings, tribal council meetings, any other type of professional meetings, then the uh, dynamics and you know the environment might much, be much different, much more respectful. So, Absolutely, I'm glad you that. I'm glad you brought up that there are gender differences in our tribal languages too, because that's really important to to make sure that you incorporate that. Yes. I don't see anybody typing any questions or comments in, so we'll go ahead and um, wrap this up. Uh, before you do the traditional closing, uh, Paulette, then I'm just going to go through the references. Um, you'll all get a copy of the slides, so you'll have this information. There's some very um, helpful tools out there for communication, leadership, um, a lot of information out there. This isn't an exhaustive list, and I know that all of you have sources and references that you could share with us. This is where you'll find the recordings of the strategic planning 
uh, toolkit webinars, including our other webinars that we're producing for your use. Our next webinar is on planning for sustainability on September 27th. So we look forward to sharing some information and facilitating discussion on sustainability with you. Thank you. We thank you for your presence, for your spirit, all of your good works, and we look forward to working with you. Um, any way that we can assist, please call us if you have any questions or requests. We have um, a survey there. We'd really like to hear from you about the webinar. That's how we know if we're reaching you, if we're having an impact. And Mark put it down there um, in the in the chat box also, so please uh, give us your feedback. With that, I'd just like to turn it over to my friend and my colleague, my relative, uh, Paulette. Thank you, Ethelene. I appreciate that. I love this picture. Um, it really shows our special connection with horses um, and tribal communities generally. Um, I want to just share a a brief prayer that I'm learning, and I want to acknowledge that it's it's not perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. So I'll give it a shot, and then I'll I'll briefly explain what it what it means. Um, so in my language, Oki nistu nitana pitu kistama aki nistu anskapi pikanaki get six six no puwau amu nistu buwa. Anuk sisikoi, igi tom sisigu. Anuk atza muska. Ayo estabata bu. Ispu makanan. Amo niksu kuwex. Anuk sisikoi. Basically, I introduce myself as bead woman, and then I'm a South Pagan woman, and I greet you, and I ask for the Creator to pray for each and every one of you, and that today is a good day, and I ask for help for all of you and all of our relatives today. So with that, we wish you a wonderful weekend, and good luck on the rest of your summer. Thank you so much, Paulette, for that beautiful prayer. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day.